on the Lord's Day, and uh, I know that there's uh, preparation involved in that, and uh, thank you, Trish, for uh, helping us to the throne of grace as we worship. Let's uh, bow our hearts and our heads together once again to pray. Lord, you are the King of Heaven, and Lord, as we huddle together here as your people on this Lord's Day, Lord, we thank you that you have promised to be among us as we gather in your name. And there's so much more that uh, you want to do in our lives, and we want to be available to you. So I pray, Lord, today that you would just lift our eyes uh, to fields that are wide unto harvest, that you would lift our eyes to the possibility that you could use us to make a difference in our world, for others to come to know Christ and become followers of Jesus. And so, Lord, we, we pray that as a church, we can commit ourselves fresh and new to that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have uh, three Sundays left with you as uh, your interim pastor. And I have to tell you that I, I just can't be more excited about the future of First Baptist Church and the, the possibilities of what God has in store for you as a congregation impacting Las Vegas and uh, the world beyond that. I, I am so excited about Zach becoming your lead pastor. He's going to be a faithful, effective, compassionate uh, shepherd of the flock. And, uh, and so for all those reasons, I, I'm excited. And I hope that you are as well as you think about the future that Christ has for uh, this congregation here in this city. Well, I want to take the last, these last few Sundays that I have with you to sort of remind us of who we are as God's people, the congregation of Jesus here in Las Vegas and again in the world beyond. And, you know, we have uh, identified what our mission is. We've stated it in these terms. You find it on the, on the posters that are out in the lobby there. I hope you'll stop in from time to time and just review those. And, but, but our mission is stated this way, that we exist to know, follow, and share Jesus Christ. And that is based upon Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. So let me ask you to open your Bibles there, please. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And as you're turning, uh, I want to encourage you to make sure that you're, you're here on uh, August the 29th. It's the day that we will have the installation service uh, for Zach as uh, our new lead pastor. It's going to be a, an important day in the long history. You think about the history of this church, 140-something years. And um, it's just... Uh, of, of all of the things that have happened in the church through the years. But this is a significant and important day, and I hope that you will plan to be here and invite others to come with you. Now, as we come here to uh, the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, remember that after his resurrection, he told the disciples that they were to go and uh, wait for him in Galilee, which is... Uh, on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, and, uh, and there that uh, Jesus would come and, and meet him. And so the disciples, uh, uh, minus Judas, who had killed himself, uh, did as Jesus told them, to go to, Jerusalem, uh, to Galilee and to wait uh, for Jesus there. And Jesus is faithful to come and, and meet with them there. And, and we're told that in verse 16 and 17, uh, uh, that they... Um, worshipped him, but some doubted. They worshipped him, but some doubted. And so there's this mixture of worship of Jesus, knowing who he is as the risen Lord, but also some doubts about the future and, and uncertainties about what is ahead, that Jesus then speaks to them in these words that are probably familiar to you, but I want us to come back to them again, beginning in verse 18 of Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It says that Jesus came to them and said this. And this morning, if I could just impress upon you, these words could not be more powerful if Jesus himself in his flesh were standing right here in front of us and speaking these words to us. Do you understand that when you open your Bible, you are having an encounter with Almighty God? And, and you and I have no less of the, the presence of the Lord speaking to us than these disciples did 2,000 years ago when Jesus stood. He's the risen Lord standing there before them speaking these words. I want us to hear these words with that kind of, of urgency. Now, this is called the Great Commission. Have you heard that phrase before? Uh, interestingly, I was reading a, uh, a survey that was conducted recently of, of younger believers, and a majority of them had never heard of the phrase Great Commission. So obviously, they didn't know what it meant. Well, what we have before us here is what is called the Great Commission. What is a commission? A commission is an assignment, and this is Jesus' great assignment for, for his church and for us as individuals. And we must never forget that. We must never forget our assignment. And if I could say something to you as a church here in this uh, last stage of my days with you, is just to never forget the assignment of Jesus for the church. And churches have gone astray when they have forgotten that word from Jesus, that commission, that assignment from him. I remember as a kid, and, and uh, I, for some reason, these details are very vivid to me. But I remember very clearly one time my mom giving me some money and uh, sending me to a convenience store just right down the street from our, from our house. Uh, and to, and uh, the assignment to go and buy a loaf of bread. So I got on my bicycle and I started riding toward the convenience store. Well, I saw one of my buddies and I stopped and played with him for a little while and then got a little further and the chain slipped off my bicycle and so I had to stop and mess with that for a little while. By the time I got to the convenience store, I was thirsty and hungry, so I, I, I bought a Coke and, and a candy bar and, uh, and got back home. And my mom asked me, where's the bread? And then it, uh, I, well, my favorite phrase, my mom always, you know, wrote me about this, uh, I forgot. I don't know, boys and girls, if you ever say that to your parents, uh, I forgot. Well, I did. And I got into a lot of trouble. I think maybe that's the reason that these details are so vividly ingrained. And I must have gotten quite a beating for that. But, um, and, and now, uh, at the other end of the spectrum of life, I find myself going into a room to do something, and I get there, and I think, why am I here? What, 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 what was I going after? Well, we, we can never forget why we are here. The, the, the providence of God established this church back in the 1880s. And it was no accident that this congregation came together with an understanding of the mission that Jesus has to, uh, to do as we are told here. And it's so easy to forget. Now, these words here in Matthew 28 were some of Jesus' last words. And you have to know that the very last thing that Jesus says to his followers before he is ascended back to heaven has to be incredibly important. And it wasn't just for those 11 disciples who met Jesus in Galilee. Uh, he told them that their assignment was to, to, to make more disciples and embed this, this uh, assignment into their hearts and into their minds as well as they teach and as they preach the gospel to the nations. 
and people come to know Christ and follow Jesus until Christ comes again. So these very words come back to us today. Again, I want you to hear them with the authority as if Jesus were standing right here saying this to us because he is. When we open our Bibles by the Spirit of God, we hear Jesus speaking to us. First of all, I want you to notice the control of Christ over all things. The control of Christ over all things. Verse 18, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, it's important that Jesus establishes this from the very start. So he is the Lord. He had, he had suffered and died on the cross of Calvary there to, to die for our sins, for our, uh, to, to rid us of our condemnation and guilt, to conquer death, which is our greatest enemy. And he did that by being raised from the dead. And he declared in doing that, he declared God's intent that he would not be the last to be raised from the dead. That all of those who've trusted in Christ are going to be raised to a new life. And his, his intent is to, is to make all things new in the universe. And by virtue of all of this, the Bible says that God exalted Jesus to the very highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that, that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so by virtue of all of that, Jesus has all authority. I want you to just listen to something that John Piper wrote. That, um, that's, when I read this, I thought, wow. When Jesus says he has all authority in heaven and on earth, this is amazing. This is an amazing statement. All authority. He has authority over Satan and all demons, over all angels, good and evil, over the natural universe, natural objects and laws and forces, stars, galaxies, planets, meteorites, authority over all weather systems, winds, rains, lightning, thunder, hurricanes, tornadoes, Monsoons, typhoons, cyclones, authority over all their effects, tidal waves, floods, fires, authority over all molecular and atomic reality, atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, undiscovered subatomic particles, quantum physics, genetic structures, DNA, chromosomes, authority over all plants and animals, great and small, Whales and redwoods, giant squid and giant oaks, all fish, all wild beasts, all invisible animal uh, and plant life, bacteria, viruses, parasites, germs, authority over all the parts and functions of the human body, every beat of the heart, with every breath of the diaphragm, every electrical jump across the million synapses in our brains, Authority over all nations and governments, congresses and legislatures and presidents and kings and premiers and courts. Authority over all armies and weapons and bombs and terrorists. Authority over all industry and business and finance and currency. Authority over all entertainment and amusement and leisure and media. Over all education and research and science and discovery. Authority over all crime and violence, over all families and neighborhoods, and over the church, and over every soul and every moment of every life that has been or ever will be lived. Isn't that amazing? That, that is a staggering thought for Jesus to say that all authority has been given to him. That these things that we think are evil, like a pandemic, are no surprise to him that he could stop it instantly if he wanted to. He has control over it. And so we, we don't have to surrender to this 
thought that, well, things are just spiraling out of control and, and, and God can't do anything about it. All authority. He has all authority and power to do whatever he wants in heaven and on earth. He is Lord. And it's important for Jesus to establish his control over everything and everyone before he states the next thing. And the next thing is the command of Christ to us. The command that Christ gives to us. So there's his control over all things and then his command. Verse 19, therefore, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, in this paragraph here, there is one single command. Uh, in the original language, it's called an imperative verb. One command, and it is this, make disciples or make disciples of all nations and it's important for us to connect the command here the command of Jesus with the control of Jesus over all things so what right does Jesus have to seize control of our lives and our resources and set us off on this grand assignment what right does he have to do that. Well, he has every right. He has all authority, all control. And, and what right do we have to go to someone who doesn't know Jesus and say, you are lost and you're perishing in your sin? What right does he have to tell us to do that? Well, he has every right to do that, doesn't he? All control. And, uh, and, and so it's the claim and the truth that all authority has been given to Christ to marshal his people on this great assignment. And that assignment, notice, is to make disciples of all nations. So we don't just go off and, and try to convert people to our way of thinking. That's not the, the thought here. We make disciples. We make followers of Jesus. We make apprentices to Jesus. We don't just make them churchgoers. We make them lifelong followers of Jesus who in turn make other disciples, followers of Jesus. So Jesus has the right to be the King, the Lord, the Savior everywhere on earth and for everyone on the earth. That's why he says all nations. It's not just for us here in the United States. He has the authority to make followers all over the world. And, uh, and that's why he says make disciples of all nations. He has the authority over all the religions of the world. All of the philosophies and the worldviews that are out there. He has the authority to stand and say to those who are followers of Buddha or, or Mohammed or Hinduism or whatever else, he has the authority to say to them, you are wrong. You're on the wrong path. You're on the broad way that leads to destruction. Repent and, and trust in Christ for the gift of eternal life. He has the right to say to all of the other world religions, that you are on a pathway to destruction. So repent. Repent means to change your mind. It means to make a U-turn in life and uh, to come to Christ. And he does this for all the nations, not just us here. And this is what we see in the Revelation, Revelation 5, 9. It says, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. When you think about nations, these are not just political entities. Nations are people groups. We have actually lots and lots of nations right here in our nation, people groups, uh, who, who share a common ethnic or cultural uh, identity. And so we 
have this charge to make disciples of all these different groups of people, not just people like us. It was what his disciples, what Jesus' disciples were told. Again, just before he ascended back to heaven, Acts 1.8, he said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what's the purpose of that? That power is for you to be uh, witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And, and church, let, First Baptist, let's not forget that. That we don't just exist for ourselves. That we need to have a heart for Las Vegas. We need to have a heart for New Mexico. We need to have a heart for the United States. We need to have a heart for the nations all around the world. And, and so this is our assignment. So there's this single command, make disciples, and then there are three parts to that, or three action steps that accompany command. In the original language, these are participles. So they explain to us how we go about doing what Jesus said and to make disciples of all nations. And so they're, they're go, baptizing, and teaching. Do you see those words there? Verse 19, go, and then baptizing, and teaching in verse 20. So those three words are connected together. They all go back to show us how uh, we are to make disciples, or to put it in terms that, um, that, w- that we can understand or remember, is we go, we show, and we know. All right? We go, we show, and we know, or grow. So let's just talk about those, those three different action steps toward making disciples. First of all, go, he says, therefore go and make disciples, literally as you are going. So in the traffic pattern of your life, you are to make disciples. And go means go. <laughs> That's, it's as simple as that. It, it means that we move from where we are to where they are people who, who need Christ. It's a deliberate movement toward people who are far from God. And again, I just have to encourage us. It's so easy for churches to get what Chuck Swindoll calls ingrown eyeballs. Ingrown eyeballs. That's, we, we just see ourselves and our needs and we, we, we fail to lose ourselves in the mission of Jesus to take the gospel to the nations. And so we go. We deliberately move. And there has to be that component in our life together as a church that we're constantly moving toward people who are far from God. Across the street, across the hall, across the, the room, across the border, across the language barrier to tell the good news of Jesus. So, so Jesus has control of all things, and he says, therefore, go. And we must go. And, and if this isn't a part of what we are doing on a regular basis, then listen, we may as well just close up our doors here. We exist for those who are not yet a part of us. So go. And then the second word, show. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we show that we are followers of Jesus through what we call to, as bapti- uh, 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 baptism. And we see here the importance of, of baptism in uh, the mind uh, of Jesus. So the, the way that new, new disciples start their life in Christ is to publicly confess Jesus as Lord through believers' baptism. Now we have behind the screen here a little baptismal pool. And the reason there's a pool there, the word baptize means to immerse. And, uh, and, and, and so we're told here of the, 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 the mode by which people are to be baptized. They are to be immersed in water. And, uh, and there's a very specific reason. That act of, a, of taking a new believer into a pool of water and immersing them is very Im- an important part of the life of a follower of Jesus. Why? It's because it's a pattern that we see set 
all the way through the New Testament. Uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus was baptized by John the baptizer. And, of course, his baptism means something different from ours because Jesus never needed to be saved. He was never a sinner. But Jesus said, John, go ahead and do it because it fulfills all righteousness. In other words, it's the right thing to do. And then in Acts chapter 2, we're seeing the, the, the Holy Spirit moving in a powerful way through the apostles. And, and um, Peter preaches this amazing uh, gospel message. And Acts 2.41 says, those who accepted his message, those who trusted in Christ, believed the gospel, notice were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to that number, uh, to their number that day. And so, new believers accepted the message of the gospel. They repented of their sins, trusted in Christ, and their first step of obedience is believers' baptism. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So he's saying there that we believe in our heart, trust in Christ, and then as evidence of that, we confess Jesus is Lord. And, and historically, the way that happens initially is through believer's baptism. That a, a, a person who is baptized has the opportunity, along with that, to confess that Jesus is Lord. And later, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He's writing here to church members. And listen to what he says in Romans 6, 3, and 4. He says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so here we see the connection between baptism and discipleship. Because what baptism pictures here is that invisible baptism that happens when we uh, are, tr when we are immersed in the life of Christ and the Spirit of God uh, immerses us into the very life of Jesus, but then the visible baptism that we practice here in this pool or in other places is a symbol. It, it, it pictures what we are experiencing. It shows us what Christ did when he died, was buried, and rose again, but it also pictures what happens to us, that we die to our old way of life. When we follow Christ, we die to sin, and we walk then in a new life. Luke 14, 27. Jesus said, And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And so again, baptism by immersion teaches us and reminds us of that reality. It's the powerful symbol. It portrays what happened to Christ when he died and rose again. And it, and it portrays what happens to us when we follow Christ. So, the normal process in the New Testament, and the reason I'm going into such detail here, is because Jesus made a big deal about it, didn't he? It's interesting that when he would give us this commission, he would so zero in on baptism. He said the normal process in the New Testament regarding salvation and baptism, that as soon as possible after a person trusts in Christ for the gift of eternal life, that they are baptized. Now the exception to this might be if a small child who grows up knowing and loving Jesus trusts in Christ. Now we might delay their baptism for a period of time because we want to make sure that they understand what all is being pictured in, in baptism. It is a confession. And we want to make sure that a child is at a point developmentally when they can do that. But other than that, the general rule is that when a person is saved, that as soon as possible, they want to follow Jesus in believer's baptism. You know, in teaching people about baptism, I oftentimes use my wedding ring. Now, when Ann and I got married 43, 44 years ago, um, 
we uh, stood face to face with one another and we exchanged our rings. And the pastor who married us reminded us that when you, when you look at that ring, it is a reminder to you that you belong to another person. And when someone else looks at that ring, they are reminded that you belong to another person. And so when we exchanged our rings, we were making our commitment to each other that we belonged to another. Now, Nan and I were dirt poor when we got married, and we barely could scrape together enough money to buy wedding rings. And if for some reason we could never have done that, we still have been just as married, have had the rings. But I say that to remind us that baptism doesn't save us. You're just as saved if you are, are not baptized. But those who have truly been saved will want to confess their faith in Christ through believers' baptism. And, and so, and, and Zach, I haven't talked to you about this, but I'm, I'm assuming it won't be that hard to do. What we would like to do is to keep the waters of the baptistry warm for the next few weeks. And so if you have never been, you've been saved, trusted in Christ, but you've never been scripturally baptized, maybe you were sprinkled as a baby, but you've never been immersed, as the New Testament prescribes, if you would talk to Zach or talk to me, and we can set that up any, the next Sunday, uh, next Sunday or the Sunday after that, or whatever works for you. Uh, because Jesus told us, this is a part of his command, to go and then to show faith in Jesus through believers' baptism. And then the third word is grow. He says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So connecting this to what goes before, the new life of a disciple is a life of obedience to Jesus' commands. We make disciples who make disciples who make disciples by teaching obedience to the commands of Jesus. Notice it doesn't say, Jesus doesn't say, go teach them what, what I have commanded. Now that's the easy part of it, isn't it? Now we can learn the teachings of Jesus. Notice he says, go teach them to what? Obey what I have commanded. All that I have commanded. And that's a, that's a staggering statement right there if you just think about it. To, to teach them to obey everything I have commanded. This is an enormous task. And so there's this process involved for the church and for you and I as believers to, to not only teach but also to be taught everything that Christ commanded. So there is this process. And the question is, are you making progress in the process? So we're all at different places in our walk with Christ. And uh, we're all, uh, some of us are new in the faith, and so we're, we're still learning the things that Jesus command that we are to obey. Some of us are a little farther along in the journey, but I'm going to tell you, I'm, I've been a believer for, for, for 60 years, and uh, at, at for a well, little, little less than that, 55 years maybe, but I, I tell you, I am still discovering things that Jesus commanded that I need to obey. That I'm being taught to obey, even at this point in my life. So there's a process. But the question is, are you making progress in the process, wherever you are? Never stop growing. Never stop learning the teachings of Jesus. Not so you can just fill your head up with it, but so that you can obey. Just think about the, the staggering statement. Everything I have commanded, that's a huge responsibility for us as a church and for us as individual believers that we are doing a good job of teaching the commands of Jesus to, to obey. And it's not, again, going back to our study in Galatians, it's not just legalism where we are um, just, just checking off the boxes. We're talking about this new life that we have in Christ and discovering that Jesus gave us these commands because he loves us. And he, doesn't, he wants us to, to, to grow in our knowledge of him and he understands that the way to do that 
is to live by the truth, and his teachings are truth. And so we, we grow by doing that, by learning the teachings of Jesus, obeying the teachings of Jesus, and then helping others to do the same. So let me ask you again, are you making progress in the process of becoming more like Jesus? So there's Christ's control over everything, Christ's command to us, and then third, the commitment that Christ makes to us. The commitment. He says in verse, the last part of verse 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Surely. Without a doubt. That is, we are about this assignment as a church we can never, ever doubt the fact that Jesus is with us in this. We are not in this alone. We're not out drumming business up for God. Jesus is with us. He's been given all authority and control over everyone and everything, over every enemy, over every disease, over every disaster, every circumstance. And that one with all of that authority has promised and made a commitment to be with us. His presence supporting us and strengthening us. I am with you always. Every single minute of every single day, Jesus says, I am with you. That's a, that, that should be an encouragement to you. If you ever feel alone, you ever feel abandoned, you ever feel that uh, you just don't have the strength to carry on? Know that He is with us even to the very end of the age. There's never going to be a split second that you're away from the presence of the Lord. And so as the church uh, is pressed into this assignment that's given to us, Jesus has promised His very presence to be with us. Now the, 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 the interesting thing here is it may be one thing for Jesus to say, I am with you, but I don't have any power. Or it would be another thing for Jesus to say, I have all power, but I'm not with you. But what he's saying here in this statement is, I am present, and I am powerful. And you can do everything through me. And church, that is our assignment. But it is also your assignment and my assignment. To make disciples. It, it's true for us. And it's true for you. And Jesus says certainly. I'm going to be with you. Every step of the way.